All right, guys, staff video, staff picture. Let's get this going, please. Hey, Heather, do you think I can uh, bring my guitar? Oh, you know, I just don't think we're going to have what? a lot of room for that. Maybe maybe just you. What about my voice? Look, I have a Santa. Just you. Oh, oh. it'll make it really festive. Not a lot of space hey, for that either. We brought the Whoa, presents. Uh -huh. yeah, no, no, there's no, no room for this. Hey, this, how you doing? This is yeah. great. Wow. Yeah. That was arguably yeah. not... No room for that like two weeks ago. Oh, for I have sure not in this I picture. Have too. Guys, I, have I was thinking flash mob. <laughs> yeah, I had the yeah, steps all ready to go mom. with the candy cane. Oh, oh, no. oh, oh, no. oh, 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 oh,
Basically, the Christmas story is basically... So we're going to be telling the story of how Jesus was born. There was a young girl who was engaged to a man named Joseph. Mm -hmm. Mary! I am the angel. <laughs> An angel came into Mary's house. Because and Mary was very helpful. An angel told Mary that she was gonna have a son and she was gonna name it Jesus. And so Mary ch told Joseph and Joseph accepted everything that Mary said. And a few days later, they got married. 
and they had to go to the stable. No, they had to go to Bethlehem. And Bethlehem, Bethlehem first. Then and then they had to go to the yeah. stable. They had to travel all the way to Bethlehem, and it took a very long time. But when they reached the little town, they found every room was full, every bed was taken. Go away, the innkeepers told them, there isn't any place for you. The people said, no room, and then you can go in the stable next door. A stable is where um, animals go. Sheep, horse, cows, um, and sheep. Plum. <laughs> the animals like go around like getting milk and stuff. And milk <coughs> making up from what? <laughs> <laughs> and there in the stable amongst the chickens and donkeys and cows in the quiet of night, God gave the, the world his wonderful gift. The baby that will change the world was born. Baby Jesus! A, the, another angel came and told the shepherds, there has been a new Christ Lord that was born tonight. And the shepherds came to Bethlehem and they just came to Bethlehem with the sheep. After the shepherds <laughs> saw Jesus, Mary, and Joseph for the first time, they went to Bethlehem and told everyone the good news. So then the king heard about it, and he's like, I'm going to lose my job. So you, you need to bring me the baby. Really? Why, three wise men heard, I mean, followed a star to get to Jesus, and they followed the star to a stable. The three wise men gave a gift called... Gold, myrrh, and jade. Jade. That's not the gift. Yeah. It was frankincense. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. <laughs> frankincense. <laughs> and gold, frankenstein, and fur. <laughs> and then the three wise men said, wow, and the shepherd said, wow. I want to welcome you one more time to Christmas Eve 2021, and I want to thank you for allowing us to be part of your Christmas Eve celebration. You know, we've just heard the story of Christmas told through the lens of children, but I'd like to take us back to that original story as captured for us by a first century physician by the name of Luke. Now, Luke was a bit of a historian, and he holds the distinction of being the only non-Jewish writer whose book was included in this collection of books we call the Bible. Luke was a bit of a historian, and he, he liked to capture things in a chronological order, and he said somebody should be capturing the life of Jesus from birth to death in order, and he took that job upon himself. With the Holy Spirit's help, we pick up the story of Jesus' birth in Luke 2, and I invite you to uh, join along with us as we pick up Luke 2.1, the Christmas story. He starts out saying this, at that time, the Roman emperor, who was named Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. We're going to stop there for just a minute because I want to give you a little bit of context. We're in the nation of Israel. We're among the Jewish people. But Rome is in charge of everything. Israel is a small but important piece of the Roman Empire. Now, government really hasn't changed all that much over the years. Governments still love to count people, primarily for the purpose of being able to tax them appropriately. The two things we cannot avoid in life, death and taxes, nothing changes. Now, in those days, a census looked very much different than it does today. I mean, today you go online, you fill out your data, you're all done. All right, we're pre-internet. We're even pre-someone coming to your house to count you. In fact, in those days when they issued a census, you had to go back to where your family came from to be counted. 
And that's going to be a significant part of our story. Let's continue on. We pick up in the next verse. Luke gives us some more information. He says this. So all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. All right, so we learn from this section that Luke records that Joseph is a descendant, a direct descendant of King David. King David as in David and Goliath David, as in David and Bathsheba David, as in the writer of so many of the Psalms David, that David. And you may think to yourself, gee, I mean, how does Joseph know that he's even related to David? And here's where record keeping became really important within the Jewish culture. You know, if you've ever read the Bible and if you've ever opened the Bible, maybe to let's say, hey, I'm going to start in the New Testament. Because I know that the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the story of Jesus and the stories are captivating and riveting. And so you, with great excitement, open to Matthew 1.1 and you start the chapter and it goes, Abraham fathered so-and-so, who fathered so-and-so, who fathered so-and-so. There is an entire chapter, 42 generations of people who fathered people. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, number one, this is not an exciting way to start a story. But number two, why is this important? But it really is important. It's important because within that genealogy, it goes from Abraham all the way to King David and from King David all the way to Joseph. It turns out that Joseph came, get this, 28 generations after King David. Now, I don't know if you've done any genealogy, if you've fa- tra- traced your family tree. I had an uncle that sort of traced our family back to the uh, late 1700s when they came over from England. But I can tell you this, we lose it after like 10 generations. We have no idea where we came from. But Joseph knows exactly where he came from. He came out of David's family. And that's important because a thousand years before Jesus was born, the Old Testament gives us all these prophecies about who the Son of God would be, who the Messiah would be. And I just want to give you three of them from this passage that we learn come true. The first is that the Messiah, the King of God, is going to be born in the city of Bethlehem. He's going to be born in the family of David. And he's going to be born into the tribe of Judah. And all three of these things are going to be coming to fruition. Things that Jesus had no control over. So Joseph has to leave Nazareth. And he has to make it all the way down to Bethlehem, which is about five miles south of Jerusalem. So we pick it up. The next verse says this. He, Joseph, took Mary to whom he was engaged and was now expecting a child. This census could not have come at a worse time, particularly for Mary. She is nine months pregnant. And Bethlehem wasn't just a little trip down the road from Nazareth. Actually, Bethlehem was about a hundred miles away over rough terrain. For those of us here at Landing Place Church, that would be like saying, hey, you need to walk to Breckenridge. Same kind of terrain, same kind of distance. I don't even like to drive to Breckenridge, let alone, I can't imagine walking to Breckenridge. We, don't even, we have no idea how long it took Joseph and Mary to make the trek down, but they have to make this 100-mile journey at the worst possible time in their life. Now, they, they finally arrive in the city of Bethlehem, which city is an overstatement because Bethlehem is really a wide spot in the road. And Luke picks up the story. He says, while they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born. And Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Now she wrapped him in cloths and she placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. This is crunch time for Joseph. They've, They've arrived in Bethlehem and again, Bethlehem probably doesn't have a lot of places to stay. Mary's starting to go into labor, and he is desperately looking for somewhere for her to be able to give birth. Now, I think probably all of us identify maybe with a character in the Christmas story. 
Maybe all of us gravitate toward one and go, I could kind of put myself in their position, but I want to hone in on one particular character this Christmas, and that's the innkeeper. You see, there were no internet reservations. There was no hotels.com. Uh, there were no VBROs. There were no Airbnbs. Joseph literally had to go up to the door of the inn and knock on the door. And the innkeeper opens the door and Joseph says, hey, man, I need a room. My wife is about to give birth. And the innkeeper goes, yeah, we're out of room. Like, no vacancy. We have absolutely no room for you. Now, I've been accused of lacking compassion and empathy over the years. But even I, if I put myself in the innkeeper's position, I mean, you're looking at this woman who's obviously about to give birth. She's, she's in labor. I mean, don't you think you could find somewhere in the inn? I mean, I mean a corner, a, a broom closet, a bathroom, a hallway. I mean, anywhere so that she doesn't have to give birth out in the street. And I ask myself the question, like, why didn't this innkeeper make a better decision? And I, I think there could be lots of reasons. The first is, I mean, he could just be ignorant. And when I say ignorant, I don't mean stupid, I mean unaware. He has no idea that the baby inside this woman is the son of God, is the promised Messiah. He's probably Jewish. He's probably waiting for the Messiah. He has no clue that the Messiah could have been born inside his inn. Think how famous he could have been. There could have been tour buses. There could have been a contract, could have been a movie deal. He missed it all. He said, you know what? I got no room. He just didn't know what he didn't know. Now, we could blame it on busyness. I mean, Bethlehem would have been popping that time of year, not because it was Christmas, because no one knew it was Christmas yet, but because it was a bedroom community for Jerusalem. And also, all the descendants of King David were descending on Bethlehem. Why? Because of the census. Same reason Joseph and Mary are there. And so it could very well be that the hotel genuinely is full. And that there really is no room. And he's just so busy at the innkeeper. You know what? I just don't have time for this. I'm sorry. No, it's not going to happen for me. But I think another reason could be this. It could just be his indifference. You know what? I see your woman here. She's pregnant. She's about to give birth. But the truth is, it's tough luck, man. It's just not my problem. It's not my deal. I don't, this isn't my issue. You're going to have to fix it. I got no room for you. Now, to be fair, Despite his ignorance, his busyness, and his indifference, the innkeeper does offer a concession. He does say this. Okay, look, guy, whatever your name is, I don't know who you are. I have no room, but I, I will give you this. There's a place we keep the animals for the people who are staying in the inn where they keep their all of their critters. I mean, if you want, at least it's not the street. It's out of the wind. If you want to go down there, um, yeah, have at it, man. Knock yourself out. Now, this year I had an opportunity to travel to Israel in the summer. Amazing trip. And I don't know, I had all these pictures of these Bible stories in my mind of what they actually looked like. And we actually had time to go to Bethlehem and uh, see where they think Jesus was born, if not the exact place, at least the general area. And what they believe in, in Bethlehem right now is that actually the inn would have been built over a cave. And you know how we have all these beautiful nativity scenes with the little wood and the straw and the animals are all very nice and quiet. Actually, what most inns did was they stored the animals in a cave underneath. And they've actually identified a cave where they, Jesus could have conceivably been born. And it looks nothing like what I had in my mind's eye. It's cold. And it's dark. And you picture it filled with animals that would have been smelly. And Joseph probably would have had to scrape manure off the floor just to find a place for Mary to sit down to have the Son of God. It doesn't look anything like I thought it would look like. And this is the place that Jesus would come in to the world. You see, the innkeeper, the innkeeper missed it, but he wasn't the only one who missed it that first Christmas. The Jewish leaders had been anticipating the Messiah, the Son of God, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. They had a picture of what the Messiah would look like. So, I mean, certainly he would be born to royalty. He would probably be born in a hospital in Jerusalem or at least a palace. There would have been fanfare and there would have been 
everyone would know when the king arrived. You see, in their own way, they suffered from some of the same things the innkeeper did. They, they were ignorant. They had no idea that Joseph and Mary would be the parents of the Son of God. They would have never guessed Bethlehem. And they were so busy with their religious activities that they, they just didn't even think about it. And as a result, as Jesus grew up, they missed him. They didn't think he was the Messiah. They didn't think he was the Son of God. In fact, John captures it for us. He says this, he, Jesus, came to his own people, the Jewish people, and even they rejected him. We're starting to see a theme here in this Christmas story. The innkeeper missed the fact that it was Jesus. The Jewish leaders and the Jewish church, as Jesus grew up, missed the fact that he was Jesus. They completely missed it because of their ignorance and their busyness and their indifference. What about you and what about me this Christmas? Because I think if there's one character in the story that I identify with the most, it's not Joseph, it's not the Roman emperor, it's not Jesus even. It's actually the innkeeper. You know, this last couple of years with COVID has caused all kinds of questions. And so many people have asked me, Mark, do you think we're in the end times? Do you think this is the end of the world? Do you think some of the things that are spoken of in the book of Revelation are, are coming true? And is this it? And I tell everybody the same thing. I don't know. But I can tell you this, we're a lot closer than we used to be. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says these words that take us back to that very first Christmas. Revelation 3.20, John wrote this. Jesus is speaking. He said, look, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice, and you open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. You see, it's no longer Joseph knocking on the door of an innkeeper. It's Jesus knocking on our door. Now, we have this amazing lens of history. We can look back at time and we can say to ourselves, the innkeeper missed it. The Jewish leaders missed it. But the same opportunity that was available to them is now available to us. Because Jesus is standing and he's knocking at the door of our heart. Jesus will never force himself into our place. He knocks. And he said, I would love to come into your life. I would love to come into your heart. Is there any room for me in your heart this Christmas? I don't know where Christmas finds you this year, but I do know this. God sent his son to earth on that very first Christmas so that he could pay a penalty that we deserved, but that he took upon us. And now he simply asks, how would you like it if I came into your heart and I got rid of some things for you this Christmas? I got rid of your anger. I got rid of your shame and your guilt. I got rid of your broken heartedness over a relationship or the grief that you're suffering or the addiction that seems to enslave you. Jesus is simply standing at the door knocking and saying, hey, this Christmas, is there any room in your heart for me? We have so much to learn from the innkeeper and the Jewish leaders. They said, no, there's no room. My prayer this Christmas for you and for me is that we would not suffer from the same ignorance that we would know who Jesus is. That we wouldn't get so caught up in our busyness of this Christmas season that we miss the greatest opportunity. And that we wouldn't allow our indifference to be a barrier. But when Jesus knocks on that door, we would say, yes, I welcome you in. I will make room for you in my heart this Christmas. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful that you sent your son to earth. And God, we thank you for not just Jesus' birth, 
But we thank you for the reason that Jesus came to the world in the first place. And that was to cover our sins and to pay for them. Pay for them in full. Jesus, right now, as you knock on the door of our heart, we want to say yes to you. We say yes to believing that you came to earth. We say yes to your dying on the cross. We say yes to your coming back to life on Easter. And we say yes to you being the Lord of our lives. We open our door to you and we open our hearts to you. Jesus, will you come in and will you bring healing and wholeness and the fullness of life that you promise. We love you and we thank you. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen and amen. Oh! <laughs>
Sad.